active. This is really interesting, Göran. So <coughs> there's a lot of dynamics to gain out of uh, being a member of a cluster, as I understand. Exactly, there is a lot of benefits. Yeah. Okay, but let us take a closer look at clusters, how they uh, work. Uh, as I said, we could start at 10,000 meters and you see part of the environment, but you don't really see how these clusters work. So you have to lower yourself closer to the ground. So let's take a look. And I picked an example here. This is uh, an area west of Sweden uh, around the city of Karlstad. First, you start to see infrastructure. You see roads, railways, airports, etc., which is, of course, part of the economic landscape of clusters. But we have to take an even closer look. Uh, and if we zoom in here, we start to see the actors that Joran talked about. Uh, companies, of course, uh, large companies, SMEs, suppliers and buyers. We see different types of organizations. We see universities, laboratories, and so forth, uh, financial actors, and so forth. But in order to really understand how clusters work, we have to lower ourselves a little bit more and get even closer to the ground. And now we start to see the actors, the true actors, i.e. the people uh, involved. And here we have some examples of people then playing critical roles in the cluster around pulp and paper industries in this region of Sweden. So in, this, in these clusters, this is where innovation takes place. Uh, it's in the linkages, it's in the meetings between people and organizations uh, at this level that we can start to understand innovation and product development and new firm formation that Joran talked about. Uh, it is really as you go down to this level that you can start to see how innovation takes place. And that is a very important role for clusters. They are important for innovation. But there's an also another side to uh, clusters which is also very important which is about flexibility, and Joran talked about this. Uh, if you have a lot of resources around, you can of course arrange them in many different ways. And one uh, good thing about clusters is that you can take these resources, it can be financial capital, it can be people, it can be business ideas, and you can rearrange them in various ways to create new patterns in a dynamic way. And this is another one of these uh, advantages of being located in clusters. But so far we have talked mostly about uh, established clusters. They are there, they've been around mainly for many, many years, and there are many, many actors that are linked in various ways. And we see innovation and, and dynamics taking place in these clusters. But uh, what about young clusters and old clusters? Is there a life cycle to this uh, yep. that it develops over time? There is indeed. And, and of course, uh, there have been uh, clusters have been around for a very long time and there are some very ancient clusters there are clusters that are dead there are clusters that are very round so they definitely have a life cycle so let's have a look at that so all clusters have to start somewhere and in the beginning often it's it's an entrepreneur who begins uh, activities in a certain area at the, at the first time and in this first phase entrepreneurship is often the the driving force that makes the cluster grow it could also be uh, uh, natural resources that uh, is the seed of, of a cluster in a certain region. In any case, uh, the number of firms increase and, and after a while you have some kind of critical mass uh, of, of industries in, in this region. Um, so, um, the cluster reaches maturity, there are a lot of economies and of scale kicking in. But clusters don't necessarily need to stay that way all the time. Um, they can decline, uh, mm -hmm. uh, dynamism decreases, uh, innovation stagnates perhaps, and after a while clusters sometimes die. And leaving behind only uh, perhaps a museum telling about the, the history of the heydays of, of the region, when the region was big in this particular industry. But it can also happen that, that uh, clusters move from one sector to another, uh, some new technology comes around and a part of the cluster captures this technology and moves away in a completely new, new uh, direction. So frequently uh, one cluster spawns the birth of another cluster or uh, turn gets into a renaissance. So there are definitely, uh, definitely mm -hmm. life cycles to clusters. Okay. So let us take an example. Uh, imagine a small town in the north of Sweden. Uh, in winter time we have minus 40 degrees Celsius. It's a very harsh climate. Uh, this is Arjeplog. And if we go back some 30 years ago, most of the people worked in the sawmill or, or the mine. But 
In the mid-1970s, there were three engineers from Germany uh, traveling in the area. They were looking for a place, a frozen lake, where they could test some brakes of one of the new cars. Uh, and they met with David Sundström. He is here on the picture here. He and his friends were running a small hydroplane business, and they had used uh, the lake to clean the ice and to plane the ice to create a landing strip for this, uh, for this aircraft. So they thought this is a good place to do these brake tests. So the first winter, I think uh, Mr. Sundström and his two buddies, they made something like 1,000 euros uh, on, on, on selling these services to, to, uh, to these engineers from Germany. Today, some 30 years later, this is a more than 100 million euro business up there for winter car testing. Testing all sorts of technologies around automotive and also other things such as electronics in harsh climate in winter time. But over time we've had a cluster to develop here with many different actors. Uh, in the beginning of course there were only a couple of small companies that did car tests for uh, some in the beginning German companies. But over time there were other companies uh, started in the area. <laughs> We also had some organizations developing and we also had some of the car manufacturers and automotive component suppliers to establish uh, larger facilities up here. Some examples I mentioned here, BMW, Mercedes and Bosch. So today, some 30 to 40 years later, we have a very dynamic and vibrant cluster with organizations, companies. It also involves research. They also have specialized education, like in Jöran's example from the surfboard cluster. And even today, companies in this cluster sell services also outside of Sweden. For example, one of the companies is now doing tests up in Yakeshi in Inner, Inner Mongolia for the Chinese car industry. So you can see how a cluster has evolved over time, developing different types of actors, different types of companies and organizations and education and research uh, facilities around it. And one of these cases is, is an interesting one, is winter car testing here in the north of Sweden. Of course, in the beginning, as Joran talked about, there were some advantages. They had frozen lakes, but there are frozen lakes in many places in the world. So in addition, you need entrepreneurship, as Joran talked about. Someone that takes the chance of using these uh, natural endowments and make some business out of it. And here in this case, we were lucky to have two or three of these entrepreneurs that set off a wave of, of, of development so that a few decades later, we have a vibrant cluster uh, active up here. So this cluster emerged in an almost organic way. Uh, policy didn't play a very important role here. Uh, there were some natural factor advantages and some entrepreneurship and the rest is history. But Jorn, I would like to turn to you again. Isn't policy also playing a very important role in clusters or are these just the natural uh, happenings? in the world markets. Right, yes. Well, evolution is certainly one way that clusters evolve, but policy also plays an important role. So you can say that well, I mean, there are two extremes here. Some clusters are purely organic developments. Other clusters, that's fairly rare, are purely planned decisions, policy decisions. But in most cases, it's actually a mix of the two. Uh, there is a lot of activity going on in, in between these two extremes. There is a mix of organic development and planned policy action. And this actually varies a bit over the world. In some world, there is more in some parts of the world. There is more stress on, on uh, policy action, planning, um, whereas in other parts of the world, there is less uh, policy uh, intervention to, to uh, promote clusters. But there is a whole range here of, of uh, mix between organic development and policy planning. And um, if we look back in time, um, sometime during the mid-1990s, uh, there was a surge in the, in the number of cluster in initiatives and cluster organizations formed. Um, we did a study on this for, for, um, for the Cluster Initiative Green Book and, and um, the, uh, we see that each year there was a large number of new cluster organizations formed and this started off particularly in the, in the, late 19, uh, in the mid and late 1990s. Uh, 